Okay, so Pablo Escobar wasn't in the picture at this point. No, he didn't even come into a picture until 1980-81. Okay. Well, eventually, Medellin would import 95% of the cocaine into the U.S. Well, that's, yeah, and that's exactly the number the government accused me of importing. So within three months, they started asking me, and they're asking me and asking me, and I just need to get rid of them. So I came up with this great idea. I'm going to tell them, listen, I don't work for anybody. You want me to be partners, but you want me to run everything for you in the United States? Good. I want equal share. I want 20%, and you got to put up my money. Now, mind you, Colombia did not produce cocaine at this time. They were bringing it in from Peru and Bolivia, and it was costing about $23,000 a kilo, 1976. So $23,000 a kilo, and we started bringing 100 kilos. That's $2.3 million. So my part of that is about $500,000. 500000 I didn't even know that much money existed in this world. So I made that stupid offer thinking that, you know, here they're going to look at this kid. He's got braces. You know, he's, he's just a young kid. And they're going to kick my ass all the way from Colombia to the uh, United States. And uh, I remember the day I made in that proposition, I went to the hotel and I was like so at ease because it would really begin to bother me. It was like every second, you got to do this, you got to do this. Well, I went to the hotel and when they came to pick me up in the morning, they said, well, Manuel wants to see you. And I'm like, well, maybe he forgot to tell me something because we had a shipping company going on. And I got to, the, to his office and they were all three, him and the other three partners. And uh, he said, we really thought a lot about, and I mean, I got petrified. I'm like, man, these people are going to kill me. They're going to insult the hell out of me. I don't know what, but at least this chapter of my life is over. And he's like, uh, we accept. And I'm like, well, good. And now imagine, here I am, 21 years old, all of a sudden, I never even seen what cocaine looks like. I'm going to be in charge of importing all these kilos of cocaine. How do you bring it in? How do you sell it? Who do I sell it to? How do you collect the money? Where do we move the money? Well, within six months, you know, I was bringing in four or 500 kilos. I was making between a one and $3 million a month. And when I got it in, in 1979, well, so we started doing that. And we grew and grew and grew. And we're bringing up to 1,000 kilos. We're doing $100 million a month. And in 1979, I decided I got approached by one of my workers. And he's like, hey, the Bolivian government wants to make a deal with you. And I'm like, well, what's that? Well, we can buy it in Bolivia for 10000 versus 20, 23 in Colombia. And they're willing to give you one on credit on top of whatever you buy. So I thought, OK, I'm making $3 million a month. Now I can go ahead and make $7 million, maybe two, three times a month. And it wasn't about the money. You know, well, I, I thought when people say, what, what is the hardest thing you give up? The money was nothing. It was that power. And I remember we worked out this deal with uh, Bolivia. And uh, when the trip went to go down, I went to Colombia to show the trip to the pilots. And I sent my right-hand guy over to Bolivia. And when all was said, I was going to uh, Nicaragua because I had business with Somoza. And he was going to put me in a jet to go to the Dominican Republic, pick up my ex-wife. I'm going to Europe. He calls me up and he says, George, they betrayed you. And I'm like, what? He said, oh, the, the only cocaine here is the one you paid for. So I got on an airplane. Now, I just turned 23 years old. I get on an airplane. I go to this guy. And, and now this guy is one of the most powerful men in the world. Overturned five governments, right? Uh, and, he, and I'm like, listen, if you ever screw me again, I'm going to kill you. And he looked at me. Well, my, my right-hand guy that was with me literally peed in his pants. And the guy looked at me and said, man, you got the biggest set of balls. Or you're the biggest idiot I've ever seen in my life. You know, next time you say that, I will kill you. So, but we became great friends. And I left. I had to go to some more, Nicaragua. Couldn't make it on a commercial flight. And I got on the airplane. We landed in Colombia. Everything was fine. My godfather was having a heart attack. He's like, what are you doing? Are you crazy? How can you get on the airplane? You know how much you can handle all of our money. Literally, by that time now, I had accounts in Switzerland, Grand Cayman, Liechtenstein. I knew all the ministers of finance of all these countries. We had a very intrigue, intriguing web. So he's like, if something happens to you, we're done. And I'm like, don't worry, nothing's going to happen to me. Well, half an hour later, we crashed over the jungles of Panama. And uh, when we crashed, the police came. And, you know, here's the thing, because I look back on my life, and as you create a God complex, right? You think that nothing's going to happen to you because you're walking around life, and it happens to celebrities, it happens to athletes. And everyone's telling you how great you are, no matter what the hell you do. And you think there's nothing, there's nothing you could do that can go wrong. And what I should have done at that moment is paid, because I had 200 pounds cash in my briefcase that I traveled with, paid the uh, little sergeant there in the little town 
outside of uh, Costa Rica and uh, tell him, listen, I got cocaine inside the airplane. He couldn't see it because the airplane landed like cliff dive. So you have to get a ladder to get out there. We literally jumped like 10 feet to get down. I didn't say nothing. I said, look, can you take our passports and get them stamped legally? I'm going to have someone come tomorrow to uh, see if they can fix the airplane and then we're going to leave. He said, sure. I gave him 100 bucks. He was happier than heck. We went to, I made a call. We had paid over a million dollars to elect the president of Costa Rica this time. So we knew that we had tremendous connection there. We're about 25 miles. And the guy in, hand, in charge of the pilot said to me, George, take the flare gun and blow this son of a bitch up. And I'm like, are you out of your freaking mind? There's $7 million in there. Now, $7 million, not a lot, now is a lot of money. 76, 79 was a lot of money. So he's like, I said, I'm not going to blow it up. We're going to get it to Costa Rica and we'll figure it out from there. Next morning, we go to pick up our passports. You know, I had a driver already come from Costa Rica. And lo and behold, I saw a DEA agent, United States Consul. I mean, they were like, the room was loaded with people. And I knew, man, the shit hit the fan. I'm like, this is done. We're done. So they, they take us into a room and, uh, and they put us in front. They had all the cocaine on this table, took all these pictures. I tell the Consul General from uh, uh, Panama, I said, look, I need to call my attorney. He said, attorney? He said, you're in Panama, man. This is uh, over here, Napoleonic law. You're guilty until you prove yourself innocent. They can hold you a year without a phone call. I'm like, all right. I knew that sooner or later, someone in Port was going to come see me. I mean, I was very, very fluent in the world. I mean, we're buying precedents during this time. We're, you know, we're spending a million dollars in corruption every month. So sure enough, two days later, the attorney general comes. And I looked at him, I said, Look, don't waste your time and mine. All I want to know is two things. How much to get my cocaine back? How much to get out of here? He's like, Noriega already sold you cocaine, 250000 for you to get out. I said, make a, a, I gave him a number. I said, use this code and use this number and your money will be here tomorrow. Sure enough, two days later, he comes and said, the money's here. We're going to fly you to uh, Panama City. They're going to rough you up a little bit in front of the DEA just to make you look good. And you stick to your story that you were looking for, uh, you were actually selling guns to the Sandinistas. And I'm like, good. So we did that. And they took us to the little, little office. They uh, sat us on these benches across the wall. And then they brought this little Panamanian kid. Couldn't have been no more than 100 pounds soaking wet, 5'4", naked. Threw him in the floor and took a broomstick and stuck it up his anum, uh, anus. And literally, blood just splattered all over the place. They looked at me and says, he only had 40 pounds of pot. And there's two pilots that were bigger than life, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, they cracked. And they started to tell him, not only was I not uh, dealing with arms, I was the biggest drug dealer in the world at that time. He said, but I just bribed the attorney general. So they took them apart and took me and this guy, Harold, into a dungeon, and then they went and tortured us for 25 days, naked, uh, cattle prod to our testicles. They beat us senseless till we pass out. We come to life, and they beat us again two, three times. Hey, tell them. But you know, the interesting thing is, I tell, this is one of the things that biggest upsets me a lot. People say, why do you get so upset with people that lie? I said, because there's something in my head that truth matters, and something in my head that says, I laid in the floor of a freaking Panamanian jail being tortured, where I, every time I went to a bathroom for five years, I passed blood because I was not willing to break my word, to break my honor, even though I was convinced that most of the people I was covering for would betray me one day, and it did. But that was the thing, like I told my kids, I didn't do it for them. I did it because I lived my life in a certain way. I don't care what I do. People can say, George is loud, he's obnoxious, he's this and that, but no one's going to say that your father is not a man. And I'd rather die than give up my honor because all I have in this earth, I have no control whether I'm rich or poor, you know, sick or alive, dead. I mean, living in this time more than ever. But I have absolutely control of one thing in life, my word. And I was not willing to break that word. So for 30 days, they torture us in ways that you can never, ever imagine. No food, uh, just drip of water, uh, no toilets or nothing, just a dirty, stinking floor in this dungeon. And uh, eventually my fear, because people have always said, you've never feared anything. I said, no. I said, the only thing I ever feared in my life was this one time, Panama, 
I fear losing my mind because there was a prisoner across the cell from me and he spent all day licking the bar. And I'm like, God, you got to. I mean, I didn't believe in God. I said, you got to kill me, but I'm not going to lose my mind. So my defense was I started cursing the officer. I started saying, listen, tell Noriega that if he doesn't kill me, I'm going to get out of here. He knows I got the power. I'm going to rape his wife, rape his daughter right in front of him. I'm going to cut him in pieces, and then I'm going to kill him. Well, I knew that either he's going to do something about it or he's going to come and just kill me. And uh, sure enough, two days later, he shows up. And when he shows up, he shows up laughing. He's like, why are you mad at me? Two things. I didn't tell on you, number one. And number two, you paid the wrong guy. And I'm like, how much? He says, 250. I said, damn, can't you guys come up with a different price? He was four guys for 250, now it's two guys for 250. Is that a standard going price? So I told him the same thing. I said, look, take this number, call, and you have the money here in a day or two. And sure enough, then he came and said, look, I'm sending you to uh, Costa Rica. Bought tickets for Costa Rica, showed them to us. And they took us to, well, first of all, they put us in this, against this wall, and with fire hydrant hoses, began to wash us down because the blood and the stench on us was horrific. And uh, I don't know what hurt more, the tortures or the wash down. But uh, we were waiting for the airport to go to Costa Rica, and Interpol came, about 30 agents, and threw us in an airplane uh, to Miami. And I got to Miami, and I was charged with heading the largest drug conspiracy in the world. I was given $7 million bond, and uh, I had just turned 23 years old, and I had no clue why they would come up with that because no one knew anything about me. It took me years to find out that my attorney had betrayed me. But until then, it was like, because one of the things about my life that a lot of people never heard, except for the government, is that I run this like a business. I didn't run it like most drug dealers run it, where to them it's a big party and they're out there with a the fanfare. And literally what they're doing is just, you know, flaunting all that drug money right in their face of the agents. And I said, look, you can win a battle. You're not going to win the war. So there's never been a wiretap of me. There's never been a picture of me with a compromising uh, individual. And I went to my office at 8 o'clock in the morning every day and left at 6, 7 o'clock. 